Recording in progress. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Magda de Meijer, and uh, I am the president of the sec or the secretary general of ECICW. ECICW is the European Center of the International Council of Women. I also have been a member of the Belgian Parliament during many years uh, for the socialists. So first of all, I would like to thank you for joining us here in this very interesting debate uh, about intergenerational dialogue for democratic participation. Friday, as you know, perhaps, is the European Day of Solidarity between generations. And of course, we couldn't let that pass. Therefore, we have uh, formed uh, a big coalition of the young European socialists, uh, yes, the European senior organizations, ESO, and together with the PES, the Party of European Socialists, and the FAPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, all together, we wanted to organize this event to install an intergenerational dialogue. And for the next 90 minutes, we will talk about how social democrats can influence the social structure in order to improve democratic participation as well from youngsters as from elder, elderly people. Uh, we will discuss the importance of uh, citizenship education, the formal and the informal one, what role can play citizen education in this scheme. And we will uh, see how to use education policies as a way of spreading the values, our values of uh, uh, tolerance, equality and emancipation. So, um, and of course, the final thing is, we want to see how to enlarge the involvement of younger and older people in, uh, the, 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 democ in, in the democratic uh, installation. So, before we enter the debate, and we, we start really uh, our, our uh, uh, evening, uh, I, want, I have a little um, announcement to make to everybody here in, the, in our uh, meeting room. You can find a QR code on your seat. Um, the idea is to participate in a little quiz. Uh, what kind of quiz is this? Uh, it's um, uh, a quiz based on the research project uh, done by the FAPS. Um, and it, it was a big research uh, on uh, the opinion of young people in Europe. So and we have some questions and you can enter them uh, by using the QR code. Uh, it's a little quiz. And at the end of our event, we will announce the winner of this quiz. Okay, uh, without further ado, I propose to start our event with uh, the wonderful introductory speech by Maria Joao Rodriguez. Uh, she is uh, the president of the Foundation for European Progress Studies, and I kindly give you the floor, please. Thank you very much, and a warm welcome to all of you. Great to have you back in the full headquarters of uh, our Foundation of Progressive Studies. Today, I will speak as the president of this foundation, but also as the chair of the PES Network on Economic and Financial Issues, setting indirectly the plan. And uh, look, just a beautiful image to have this dialogue for democratic participation. PEAC is my, our main focus on intergenerational solidarity. Yes, uh, we progressives, want to have with real opportunity and equality for all. And we progressives, we are inventing new solutions. We are creating this. But the big word is in fact solidarity. Because uh, we will be confronted at the end of this week moments of testing our solidarity regarding, first of all, you remember back in the financial crisis, where we had the incredible, dramatic uh, destruction of many jobs, of many opportunities, particularly for young people. And then by working together, we could come with the full response of turning the page of austerity and bringing again uh, growth and the new kind of growth to Europeans. This was the first success of uh, progressives. But then 
more recently, we were really confronted uh, not only with the um, pain of these turning the page of austerity, but something new, the pandemics. And the pandemics, again, was a big moment for testing our solidarity. Uh, and uh, we need to protect everybody. Those who were more vulnerable to the uh, COVID-19 and making vaccine for all a new kind of European public good. And it worked also thanks to our initiative in all European institutions and also at national level. So this means that intergenerational solidarity makes a real difference. But now we are again confronted with a big, big, big problem in our borders, war coming back to the European continent. And this is again being a test for all of us. First of all, because we need to organize a strong welcome from the refugees, the heroic people of Ukraine. Secondly, because we need to fight with all our power of Europeans to turn the hands of the aggressives. And uh, for this, uh, we need again to have strong solidarity regarding the way we are using energy, the way we will protect our jobs. Uh, I must tell you that hard times are coming. And again, we believe that solidarity will be the real solution for us to reply to this new uh, situation. Um, let me conclude by referring to something which is uh, taking place right now, which is the Conference on the Future of Europe. This is about to conclude. And let me tell you that we progressives, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that the aspirations of citizens of all ages, they will found a real answer coming from the European institutions. We cannot afford just to ignore the problems. And uh, let me uh, recall the very important principle of the European Union, which is the principle of non-discrimination. We cannot discriminate people for whatever the reason, including the age. So young people and uh, elderly people and people from all generations, they need to make sure there is no discrimination. And let me put the focus, my final focus, in fact, on young people because uh, young people have been exposed to a sequence of crises. And now here we are again with a new one. And we cannot have a lost generation. So uh, we cannot accept to have uh, young people being discriminated in their wages, in their jobs, in their access to social protection, in their access to real opportunities to quality education. And this is the promise of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So let's make the final push. Uh, our family is fully organized for this, but also let's listen to the ones who are participating with us today because they can come with the uh, last ideas to bring on board in this Conference on the Future of Europe. Thank you so much. Uh... Maria Joao. Um, and uh, yes, welcome again to everybody, not only the people here in the room, but also all our followers online. Uh, we would like to hear from you. Please uh, use uh, the comment uh, space on uh, Facebook Live uh, and let us know from where are you listening, uh, what are you thinking, what are your questions about uh, the topic we are going to discuss uh, today. Please let, let us hear from you. Uh, and for the people uh, in the room, uh, we are so glad we finally meet you in person. <laughs> it, it has been a, a long time uh, that we had to do everything online, so it's, it's really warm on the heart to see you all in the flesh. Um, now, um, I would like to introduce the speakers of our first panel. And I'm so glad we have all women's panel. Uh, very nice. Um, I start with uh, Evelyn Loche. Evelyn, nice to meet you. Uh, she is the vice president of YES, of uh, the youngsters. Uh, then we have uh, Elisa Gambardella. Uh, she is um, from the Solidar Foundation. Uh, she will talk, what, talk about what it stands for. And she is uh, the education and lifelong learning coordinator of that foundation. And then last but not least, we have Laura. 
Laura Sparavina, uh, and she is a city councillor in Florence. Uh, and she is also the chair of the Education, Training and Employment Committee. So I would like to ask our dear speakers, what elements uh, should um, absolutely be part of citizenship education uh, to empower Europeans of all ages to participate in democracy? <clears throat> how, how can we do that? Please. Hello, everyone. Um, I think you can think of um, certain councils, for example, uh, like youth councils or senior councils on local level. I think they are uh, the best way uh, to uh, let um, citizens participate on a local level, level to start. Uh, you should also have um, the right infrastructure for all generations, like community centers, or sports centers where um, citizens from all generations come together and where also uh, local politicians can meet them um, and discuss um, issues with them. Um, what other things where I also think of is um, for like in law, like um, um, impact assessment, uh, which um, would uh, study every um, new uh, legislation or policy uh, for every generation if it has a negative impact. Uh, and if so, uh, to think of uh, to mitigate those uh, negative impacts. Um, these are already uh, certain examples. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I give the word to. Uh... Yes, please. Thank you, and uh, I certainly agree with uh, Evelyn that these are all important things um, and about the very important role of political education, right, when we talk about citizenship education. Yeah. Uh, but just to come back uh, to, to what you mentioned indeed to explain what Solidar Foundation is, first of all. So Solidar Foundation is the educational hub, we call it, of Solidar, which is a European network for progressive suicide organizations working to advance social justice through a just uh, transition. Mm -hmm. So we call it the educational hub because out of our 50 plus members, 20 of them work indeed on uh, education and lifelong learning related activities and citizenship education is absolutely key for them, exactly because uh, as civil society organizations, sorry, they can come in and cooperate with formal education institutions in a way that deliver a more comprehensive kind of education, but especially because they can reach out to target groups that are mm -hmm. more hardly reached out by institutions such as uh, formal uh, like uh, formal education institutions, such as schools, for instance. Uh -huh. So uh, in this sense, I think it's also very important and to be appreciated that today we're talking about citizenship education, because oftentimes we found also through our annual publication, the Citizenship and Lifelong Learning Monitor, that in a, a lot of member states, we talk about civic education. <clears throat> Apologies for this. But uh, we should, in fact, broaden the scope. Civic education is not enough. We should, as we are doing today, talk about citizenship education, which includes education to rights, political education, but also, for instance, uh, digital citizenship education. So we should enlarge the scope in this sense. And then um, in terms of broadening the scope, we should also be aware this is something we are promoting as Solidar also towards the institutions, for instance, for the recent uh, report in the European Parliament on citizenship education, the concept of global citizenship education, which is political education on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So of course this broadens uh, a bit the scope and in so doing also allows more learners to be welcomed. Mm -hmm. So addressing your question, how can we reach out to more target groups? I think it's very important the role that formal education of course plays, so especially with young people, but it is also important to support teachers in delivering, delivering citizenship education. So many times we know that citizenship education is not a standalone topic mm -hmm. as a curriculum, which is problematic for, for this to be delivered adequately, but also that teachers are not offered enough training opportunities, time and support to do this properly. And along with that, including civil society organizations in the picture, would allow to include non-formal, informal learning opportunities, such as the ones that organizations like the Young European Socialists offer to all their members, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it, it, by doing these experiences that you can learn a lot or by joining organizations that are a member of Solidar as well. So I think these are uh, very important uh, tenets for citizenship education to uh, have a comprehensive view that includes informal, non-formal uh, education, and then to have also a, a vision 
that includes different stakeholders. So society organizations, but also to have as a principle and really a firm one to halt the commodification of education, which is taking over citizenship education as well. Mm -hmm. And in this, uh, I think the progressive have a very important role to play. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, please, Laura. Thank you. Um, first of all, please let me um, be thankful to you all to, to be here. And um, I really like to just gonna be a few seconds oh, to, ex uh, I mean, to just share with you, with you how much I am um, excited. And at first it looks like kind of weird for me, but being here in person with you all without wearing a mask is like yeah, nice. an amazing, huge uh, final goal that we reached after two years that had been super long. And because I am a city councillor, uh, the way I've been living the last two years has uh, um, been really, really impressive mm -hmm. for me as a person and for me as a politician. And because we are here with the Socialist Party, with the FEPS, I think uh, it's important to start from this point. Mm -hmm. uh, reaching to the question, yeah, which yeah. I really want to give an answer, I think that uh, you both had already um, gave precise contribute from a technical point of view. So I'm just like to share with you an experience from my city council, first, not, from, not from my city council, from my city, that we have been uh, following into from the city council that I think is giving us as an example of how we can actually broad those theoretical and um, those theoretical values and discussion and point of view to the practice and to the everyday life. Uh, very close to the city center of Florence, which I think you might all know for Ponte Vecchio and many nice stuff. But there are people who live there and who needs everyday um, services. Uh, that and whenever you're talking about social services. Whenever you see the everyday life from the social policies point of view, you see how much hum humans are similar, despite the difference of ages, despite the difference of genders, despite the difference of cultural and of place where we come from. At the end of everything, we are just normal, classic, simple humans. Our needs might change by the uh, our age, obviously, and by our uh, personal uh, identity and char char characteristic. But at the end of everything, we are still humans and we need to uh, understand that try to force ourselves to have public services, services that combine different needs instead of sharing them is the only way we can get out from the actual system. So very close to the city center, there is this place as called as Gazometro, which I hope you will find a time to, to visit whenever you're coming to my country. In this place, it's really small and it's an historical garden where you have, it's like it's like uh, the size of a really small room, I mean, of a small garden. You have a garden, you have a bistro, you have a ment mental health care system, you have a kindergarten, you have an elderly center, uh, you have a public hospital. It might seem like a chaotic situation, but it's right the opposite. That is the most example of the uh, citizenship education I think we might uh, try to have, where everyone uh, finds the, uh, the solution to his own needs by sharing public spacings, by sharing uh, public finance, by sharing his everyday life with everyone else, where everyone who uh, has a need uh, is forced in a good way, obviously, to cooperate, to collaborate, to share everything with another one. So in that case, solidarity is not anymore that you're just teaching, which is obviously is super important, uh, extremely important, but solidarity is the way you, you learn how to live and you learn how to satisfy your everyday needs from the easy peasy one, like uh, getting food to the super complex one, like uh, having a healthcare uh, situation. So what I'm trying to say, it was just offering you this example and sometimes it's important to dream, but it's even important to give concrete example to see how much is possible. And the other thing is, uh, I think we should be more brave, braver, I think is more correct in English. But anyway, we have to be more, more brave because the, really there is no more time because when we were saying before that we are losing a generation, it's not just anymore my generation. I am 28 years old. So with my generations, there are, I mean, we already have some problems that uh, are structural and you just need to see the demographic um, statistics and other stuff. But we should just learn 
from the uh, recent past mistakes, and we can just together avoid to remake those mistakes. So we need to be brave. And I think the good point of the COVID crisis, of this recent um, humanitarian crisis, is that whenever we stand together, we can find uh, tools to grow up, to face the, uh, the, the problem together. So please, let's be brave. Let's do it now. And let's always bring everyone together. Just one small example, because I'm always afraid that people might think that I do not believe in the elderly generation and no one can never survive alone, not even the most youngest and the most intelligent young woman. Um, there is another way of matching the elderly center and the Kirden Garden. Yeah. Once again, the old one, the oldest one in, in a city, the elderly generations, if is brought together with a super young one, with the kids, the one under five years old, they together has super good um, uh, effects under a healthcare point of view, under a social point of view, under economic point of view. So we are never doing something just for one. And by one, I mean a generation or a person. We are always doing something for everyone. So cooperation and being brave once again. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yes, absolutely. I, I can see also in my own community, uh, there are plans to, uh, to open a playground for children next to the senior home. That's nice. It's very nice. Um, okay, I have um, two more questions also for the room. Please uh, think about it together with me. Um, the first question is, do we need to adapt our methodology or our policies to different age groups? Is that necessary? And the second question is, uh, what are exactly the pro progressive values we want to see at the heart of the citizenship education? So those two questions, please think about it. If, if you want to come in for the discussion, please do so. But I will first, again, give the floor to the partic participants of the panel for just two minutes, well, just two minutes, and then uh, the room will get uh, time uh, to, to uh, pose your questions, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, I would also uh, like to refer what Elisa said. What I think is very important for young people is to start at school. Uh, so in education, um, as a concrete example, in Belgium, Flanders, since a few years, uh, there is uh, some schools that give the course of active citizenship, which I think should be uh, more mandatory in all schools, because uh, it's literally the start uh, for young people starting to uh, participate in democracy, starting to uh, think and um, starting to know about their rights. Um, then uh, for um, the second question already, or? Uh, yeah, please. Okay, uh, what is very important for a progressive party is of course inclusiveness. Uh, that means uh, really, uh, like I said, the councils, maybe also think about a council on European level uh, of uh, all generations. So literally the, an intergenerational council on European level, so citizens can uh, participate and think about uh, EU policy. Um, uh, what I and also, of course, representation. But here tonight already, uh, you see young women who are invited uh, to think and to participate. Uh, so that's already a very good example uh, of progressive uh, values. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, when it comes on uh, methodologies, I think, uh, yes, it's absolutely important to um, be aware and acknowledge the fact that different groups of the population have different needs. And this means that um, there isn't one uh, pedagogy that will fit all. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this sense, uh, I think, of course, formal education is absolutely important. But then again, taking into account the role of informal and non-formal education is just as important mm -hmm. uh, for both young people as well as for adults. For instance, uh, adult learning is now um, becoming increasingly important because mainly because of the twin transitions. I mean, it was always important, but now also in the policy making. I mean, fortunately, 
And uh, this is something that should be taken into account, of course, that adults have different needs than the one of young people. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for, for the elderly, right? So in this sense, uh, what I was referring to before in terms of in involving different stakeholders mean for us to involve different kinds of providers that are able to cater to different needs. And this way also reach out to different brackets of the population. Um, so it, it's a matter of outreach, but it's a matter of pedagogies as well. And for this, you have specialists uh, in each of these sectors and they should all be included in order to be inclusive then in the delivery of education policies and citizenship education among them. And when it comes to the progressive values, something that we try to promote um, with Solidar is, as I was saying, global citizenship education, because this includes uh, education to uh, sustainable development, education to environmental sustainability, political education, digital citizenship, citizenship education, and it is a value-driven education in general. So it leads to education to democratic participation. Mm -hmm. um, so in this sense, it not only raises awareness about global uh, challenges and issues, it provides with tools. And finally, and most importantly, contrary to other pedagogies, it empowers learners mm -hmm. to take action. So I think this is what, as progressives, we can... Uh, we can mm -hmm. promote in order to achieve the, the, the society that we all uh, dream of and work for. Thank you. Laura. Um, I'll try to be shorter than before. I'm sorry. Oh, no, please. So no. once again, uh, just three points. First of all, we should, I mean, the elder generation was used to take part, to stand up, in the uh, not always global challenges, but to the national challenges. They came from a period where they actually receive, uh, sorry, received uh, political education in a formal and sometimes even, sorry, in an informal way and sometimes even in a formal way. Uh, that's a matter of fact. Without, I, I'm not going into the, the, the debate in each single country, but that's something we should uh, always keep in mind. The youngest generations, so everyone who comes after, I would say, between 40 and 35 years old in this case, uh, didn't receive, or uh, well, let's say, not everyone received, uh, not even an informal political culture, which means that sometimes they do not even know how to do something. They do not even know that they can actually do something and stand up. So uh, I will just try to give an answer from this point of view. First of all, we should be more able to um, develop a way of being uh, active while we always keep together the macro, is it an English word? Macro point, uh, point of view, but always strongly connected to the micro action that we can do in everyday life. I will show you an example once again. Uh, in my country, Italy, uh, we have a strong problem in uh, 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 by having huge levels of social injustice between different gender. This is something that we all know. Uh, this is the macro level. Micro level, micro action, this summer with uh, many other peoples, with many different stakeholders, with many uh, people from different ages, we just uh, make a tour all over around the country asking for the, re uh, the reduction of the tampon tax. So something really small, really easy peasy to be understood, to explain a totally different, much more complex vision of the world. First, we should, and as a progressive family, we should be really be more able and force us to have this way of, talk of thinking more frequently. Second of all, uh, combining the tools. My grandfather uh, was fighting on the mountain again against people who were uh, occupying my country, so he would never understand internet, and it's fine because my father and uh, my grandfather is over eight years old, and it's fine. But I am 20, I, 28 years old, so maybe it would be nice if I teach to my grandfather how he, he can use Skype to talk to my brother who's living in Brussels because now he's working here. And that is the word that we have been fighting for and that we st should stand for. The word where you can go everywhere you want to realize yourself. So we need to combine the uh, tools of being active in the, in the real life with the tools to be active in the uh, virtual life. Is it correct? Otherwise we will lose a generation. And once again, 
no one can just survive alone. Our uh, our goal is not just to have young, wild, and free generations and to forget about the other one, but would be crazy and madness thinking the opposite. So try the way to combine those tools. This is a way, and uh, sometimes it can be hard because we are not used to doing it. I am 28 years old, but I'm much more used to the uh, to the real life activism. But if we want to stay, to keep in contact with the youngest, we should do. And another uh, another point, sorry, uh, being able to communicate with the one who are younger than me, so with the real youngest generation, is extremely important if we want to keep in touch with the time. Not if you want to live in the future, but if you want to understand the today, the everyday life. Do we really feel? Are we so arrogant to think that we can understand what everyone wants just by having lived our own life? No, it's not possible. So combining the tools. Third, uh, and I'm really finished, mm -hmm. is like uh, having a bike. Would you ever think to ride a bike just by having one wheel uh, working? No, it would be impossible. It's exactly the same thing with the society. Society is made, is a combination of many different social groups, many different um, social groups. I would just say that. Sorry, I'm always checking you for <laughs> picture. Um, I just said I have been practicing English for a while, thanks to COVID. So uh, sometimes I'm just check. And so, and each single social group has his own needs, his own way of talking, his own way of getting connection with the others. But as a bike, we need to learn how to cooperate, how to active, how to involve each of them, respecting their own way, but finding bridge with others. Otherwise, the society won't work and the bike will just stay uh, stop in our garage and we really don't want it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. So high time, uh, we hear from you. Uh, what are your thoughts? What are your um, ideas? about the questions we have uh, been talking about until now. Do you have any remarks, any questions? Uh, please, take the floor. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, over there. <laughs> yeah, Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a very good like, example, I think. <laughs> People are put into categories, eh? yeah. and especially the, the link between uh, elderly and needy people, you know, uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's not good, it's not good. It, it reminds me a bit about uh, uh, some years ago, there uh, also in Belgium, there was an uh, intergenerational dialogue started uh, within the framework of the uh, King Baudouin Foundation, and it brought uh, young feminists and elder feminists together uh, on, on, on several topics. And it was really, really, really very nice, very nice. And after a long discussion and very uh, heavy discussion uh, around the table, the conclusion was, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> it was really a very nice experience. Um, yes, someone else or, or someone from the panel who wants to react on uh, what uh, what is said in the in the room? No. No one else who wants to share something, an experience or uh, an idea 
or um, yes, please. Uh, I will I will keep seated, <laughs> um, but actually, uh, first I will tell because Jules told me to tell, but also because I want to tell. We also um, <laughs> organized <laughs> an event recently between the Young Flemish Socialists and um, um, the, what's it called? The Seniors. The seniors? Yeah, what's the official name? I don't know. <laughs> I forgot. It's because I'm talking in English and thinking in French and Dutch. Okay. So it was very nice. It was about um, the socialist history uh, in Belgium and which lesson, lessons to learn and to look to the future. Uh, but actually why I was taking the mic is because, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody here, but I, th I don't think I will, is that often it is said that um, the older you get, the more conservative you get also. Look at the Brexit, for example. But not, 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 not people here, but I mean, in general, let's say people say this. Let's look at the Brexit, for example. It has been um, known that the, the outcome of the Brexit has been largely determined by votes of the older people mm -hmm. um, on the other hand um, I'm looking at Belgian now because I'm Belgian um, uh, we still get a lot of votes a lot of votes to the socialist parties are coming from the, an, an older age group um, we see also that the um, how to say the members of the parties that are declining the amount but they are still mostly older people still young people don't <laughs> Um, become members anymore. Um, they're more volatile. Let's say when election they vote this, then that. Do you, the panel, see how we can like find each other more, maybe more in a militant way, or how to learn from each other, how to get the, the not again, not these people in this room, but like how to make sure that the older you get, you don't get more conservative, and how to get young people to be more militant or how to say uh, how to get yeah you know what i mean i guess yeah yeah <laughs> thanks for the question one of the panelists wants to get in um, <laughs> come on laura i'm thinking <laughs> uh, i think it's one of the key questions the one you just made uh I, i'm not quite sure that i uh, i'm able to answer no one wants to be rude with anyone, let's be clear, but it's a matter of fact just by uh, reading most of the uh, national election results that um, it happens quite frequently that um, as much as you get old, as much as you move to a more conservative, not party, but a point of view on many, many uh, facts. That's a matter, but there might be many, many reasons. Um, I'm not yet sure I know how to answer to this, but I would add uh, something to the discussion. Sometimes uh, politicians should be brave once again and accept that they might lose some consents, some uh, consents is fine, in the oldest generation and be brave in proposing different policies, different social policies that maybe in the short time will be not appreciated by the older generation, but strongly needed by the, all the others, but not, just not the youngest, the, all the others generations. Otherwise it will look like we are fighting old and young, but it's not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I will just say you, you that, tell you that maybe we should stop running uh, um, for the research of the older vote and try to propose solution to get the young one first. Second, getting back to what we were saying before, if, you, if now we are living in a world where the uh, digital revolution is just something that is, has already happened, it's not something that is happening, has already happened. And if there is, like in my country, we have three people over 80 years old for one person under 30 years old. Mm -hmm. It means that if I don't give tools to those who are uh, older to read the word, to understand the new word, to understand how the word is actually working so far by, other, for example, digital education, but it's not the only way. We can have many different ways. It means that I'm, I'm just uh, doing... Uh, I'm just um, creating politics, a system that will keep them apart 
from what is happening. So I'm not giving tools to make people understanding what is happening and to live not a different world, but in a different way. And guys, is normal that, I mean, as much as they, they uh, everyone, I'm not saying anything now. So the world is always changing. It's like if in this moment I will go to high school, even though I am 28 years old, there are many things that I won't be able to understand because I am 28 years old and kids just change. So first of all, I would uh, say first bra being brave. And second, I will talk about digital education. And the third one is, again, keeping everyone together. Don't never stop to talk to each other. So if we keep to have an approach to the social services and to social policies where we divide generation, trying to answer easily to the each single needs, well, this is what we uh, got. And we have people dividing in each, uh, each um, mm -hmm. own needs. So, and to conclude, I would propose in this case, try to create the locomotive of welfare and is, uh, I mean, is super studied into the academic fields. And it's just where everyone is in a locomotive, it's strongly connected to the other one. And you have the youngest, the say in the front, the oldest, the stay in the back, but you need experience of the one and the freshness of the other one, just staying together. And so get even used to create events, as you were saying, thank you for sharing or creating policies or creating a new way of making a city council budget where instead of dividing, we try to combine. Mm -hmm. Obviously we need to have a, a method otherwise it's chaotic, but let's try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Lisa. You. Uh, no, yeah, just a few. Of course, I do not have the answer to to these very important questions, but uh, it just prompted a few thoughts. Uh, besides, I totally agree with what Laura just said, of course. Uh, but I think it's also um, there's different and many elements that are linked to to your question, such as what I could think about is uh, the still uh, ever important question of party renewal in terms of the political parties being able to attract. Uh, younger people, but then uh, more in general, uh, party renewal and also societal renewal in a way um, could also be a matter for uh, public administration in general, for instance, um, in terms of uh, inclusiveness, inclusiveness of methods, inclusiveness of uh, approaches, and therefore results uh, that uh, includes different um, age groups and different people in this sense. So I think this uh, could be the North Star for achieving what we're talking about. And then um, I also wanted to underline that nevertheless, social engagement does exist, even if it doesn't happen, maybe in the ways that used to happen in the past, social engagement is a very important driver for a younger generations. So it's more a matter of understanding um, how can this social engagement and willingness to be uh, engaged be transferred in a way that is beneficial also for the more traditional party structures and notably for the progressive parties, of course. But in this regard, although I do not have uh, any of the answers that you were looking for, I know that FEPS has some because they released uh, studies in the past related to millennials as well as Generation Z. Mm -hmm. So um, I cannot um, share the results because uh, I was not, I mean, I'm not the expert in the room about that, uh -huh. but um, I totally invite uh, all the people in the room and following online to, to check those out because I think they can address many of the questions that you raised. Um, I will say there's already a lot that have been said, um, so I can only say something uh, short. Uh, what I do think is it also has to do with your uh, mindset a bit, I would say. Look at an open view of how uh, certain policies affect both generations. Uh, like, for example, childcare. In first instance, you think it's for young people, but it also affects the young grandparents who take care of uh, grandchildren. Um, then also pensions is uh, something you don't think about when you're 30, but how it, your pensions are shaped now can define how it will be in, when it's our time to receive a pension. Um, also, I would um, like for housing is now for young people a very important uh, subject. Um, and uh, I would love that um, older generation would also help us to think about uh, this current issue uh, because it was a very different situation back in their time when they were buying their first house. 
Um, so, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think uh, I I want to give also another example. Um, uh, we um, we have experience here here in Belgium and probably in in more than one country in Europe. Uh, it was um, it's concerning uh, the the uh, the whole movement about climate climate change. Yeah? So it was heartwarming to see that the, the the big movement and the big manifestations were led by very very young women, often very very young women. Uh, and uh, it, it was uh, here in Belgium. We started also with the grand the grandparents for. Uh, uh, against climate, for climate change, for the climate pro pro problem, and uh, we are wo working together closely with the young activists and the grandparents uh, about climate change. It's also a nice example, I think. Uh, okay, I uh, propose to close uh, this uh, first panel, and thank you very much about uh, everything you said and uh, uh, the, the ideas you brought uh, into our uh, debate. Um, I think it was very interesting. Um, we have to close this first panel now. Uh, we are, uh, for the people who are um, following us online, uh, we are going uh, out a little, a little bit. And uh, in the meantime, you will see a, a video, a video of uh, Sergei Stanishev. He is the president of the PES, uh, and he will uh, talk to you about uh, three minutes and then in that time, we have uh, time to change our panel and then you come back in online within three minutes. Okay, thank you. Dear friends, the intergenerational dialogue is uh, extremely valuable and one of the fundamental principles of our family. This is why I'm very happy to welcome you to the event and discussion today. As you remember, in the past, we launched together our campaign for the youth guarantee. We fought hard. Many people didn't believe it will be successful, but in the end we delivered an instrument of the European Union which changed the life of many dozens of thousands of young people across the European Union. We initiated in cooperation with our seniors organization, also a dialogue and policy making on the pensions which is also extremely important for many European citizens. We are a party of inclusion. We are a party of mutual respect between different generations. And we have to value and to cherish these characteristics of the socialist movement. Because the contribution of each one of you, our young militants, our senior members and uh, activists, is very important for the final outcome in elections and in the way how we change Europe. This is why one of the priorities of the Party of European Socialists is really to strengthen the civil participation in politics. We cannot let populists gain on the fears which are widespread in Europe and exploit that for their own political purposes. Back in 2019, together, we achieved a very massive mobilization for the Party of European Socialists and for our Spitzenkandidat, Franz Timmermans. We made a campaign which was talking to people from different nations, from different social backgrounds and realities, but also from different generations. I think this was one of the reasons why we achieved the result much higher than it was predicted by many public opinion agencies. And we have to learn on that experience and develop it. And I believe that the dialogue we are having today will be another contribution to this process in our family with the support of YES, with the support of ESO, with the support of FES, FEPS as our foundation. All the best to you, good luck in the discussion and very fruitful results. Thank you.
the second panel. Um, here we are again. Hello. <laughs> um, and uh, our second panel is going to tackle the question, how can progressive parties and organizations support international and intergenerational uh, solidarity in political participation? That's the topic of our second panel. And we, are, we have, of course, very interesting panelists. Uh, first of all, Viktor Nigrescu. Um, the, Mr. Nigrescu is a member of the European Parliament. He is vice chair of the European Parliament Culture and Education Committee and president of the PES activists in Romania. And also founder of the Foundation for a Democratic Left, uh, one of the member organizations of FEPS. Um, at the very end, uh, we have uh, Jos Bertrand. He is uh, president of the European Senior Organizations. And then in the middle, uh, we have Anna Pirchkalava, uh, and she is the secretary general of YES. So we have a mixed panel now. That's nice. Um, uh, so we all know uh, what, what, what's the problem. We have an aging society. We have uh, difficulty to attract new young activists. Um, what can the social democratic movement do uh, to attract young people and to ensure that younger and older activists, that they are well equipped to participate in, in the democratic ideas and in democratic development. Eh? So that's the question of this panel. I don't know uh, who wants to start. Ladies first, please, Anna. Um, first of all, thank, thank you for having me in this panel. And the questions you raised, I think, has already been tackled by previous panelists from the previous panel. And I think there were several interesting points uh, that have been raised, and I want to emphasize a couple of them. When we are talking about young people's involvement in politics, uh, we mostly are meaning behind it that young people are less and less keen to join the traditional uh, parties. They are less and less interested to form the traditional establishment party structures. And we as a young socialists, uh, we also are seeing this problem a lot because our youth organizations are directly linked to the uh, mother parties. And I think uh, the the, it has a different, this question has a different aspect and answers, but I want to focus on one of them that is, uh, for example, a young generation focusing at the moment on more topic based, single topic based uh, issues. Uh, it has been mentioned here uh, by you, uh, Magda, the Friday for Future. We see that young people, younger than me, for example, I'm, I belong to millennial generation, but younger than me, Gen Z, um, they are very much interested into climate issues. And they are self-organizing themselves in the Friday for Future or any other strikes and climate actions. And we see that these people are not uh, non-partisan. They are not identifying as a members of one or another party, but they are around the topic. The another uh, example is Black Lives Matter, where there is a very strong topic, racial discrimination. And here we also see there is a topic and that really unites uh, people around it. The same is a Me Too movement. Um, and uh, when, when we see these young people as a partisan organization that is composed of uh, uh, youth party organizations, we also ask ourselves a lot, how can we recruit these young people who have a lot of energy and enthusiasm and a lot to bring in our movement? So our main question is also, how can we make our organizations, our par parties more attractive for them? And one of the ways is maybe also making our party structures more democratic, more transparent, more youth friendly, when young people can see themselves represented, when young people can see that the party is addressing and tackling the issues that are important uh, for them. And of course, even though I agree that there is no use issue and every, every issue is a use uh, issue because uh, for us, everything is important that is happening, but still there are concrete topics that I mentioned before that 
that will be interesting for uh, for young people and that attracts them uh, in the in the party structures so i think that young people are not apathetic they are really much uh, interested into politics they have a lot of energy but at the same time maybe we also have to be self critical self analytical into uh, analyzing and restructuring our party structures our youth organizations as well in order to accommodate the needs of the young people so i will stop here and later on maybe um, i will go deep into into other topics thank you uh, maybe it's functioning yes uh, i am i am jos bertrand i am 69 years old and uh, i will talk about the elderly in the parties and when i was young we had to fight for more awareness in the party for younger. And now, and thank to all, we have a young party leader who is 30 years old. We see that our party become very, very attractive for youngsters. It's very important. But on the other side, we see now that there is no more interest or less interest to the elders. And I will give some example how we can integrate more this senior members in the party. For instance, we have to look that seniors is not one group. We have seniors who become very dependent, who are living in care houses, mm -hmm. and who have a very, very long tradition in the party. And we forget these people. And I think as party, we need to also to go to these people. You said you, you are from a family. That's one. But many, many of our senior members are very active. And we represent 30% of the electors. And in many parties, for instance, the SPD, over 40% is older than 60 years old. And there's it's very important that our parties organize the seniors. And many parties in the European Union don't have longer senior organizations. And we, are very, we find it very important that these people will be organized and that the parties give tools and give uh, services to these organizations. We have organizations as S+, I am working also as a volunteer in, in S+. We are, we are linked to the party. But we need support from the party to go to the seniors, to help us to make political education. Also, in the, in the, in the first panel, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. There is a very, very lack of education on politics. And we are praying for more education in politics. As elderly, when we are looking to the new tools they use to participation, we are very astonished to look at it. I call it the post-it democracy participation. <laughs> we as elderly, we like to in-depth discussion, for instance. And I think it's very necessary that our parties think about political education as solidar and as also, uh, um, it, it, I think it was Laura who, who, who talked about it, that we formed the people to think in politics. This is for us very important. Let's say, and at least we are also asking for guaranteed representation of seniors in the party structures. As you know, in the PES, ISO is only an observatory member. In our party, for instance, and I'm looking to the Flemish parliament, for instance, that's the overall parties. In the Flemish parliament, and Magda know it, we have 24 members of parliament and only six all parties are older than 60 years old. And I think that we need also to look both to youngsters and to elderly to be present in this politic decision-making organizations. We, I will go come back to other things, but uh, I think in the yes. first round it's... Thank you, Jos. Uh, our last uh, panelist, please, Mr. Nigrescu. Hello to everyone. And for the invitation, I think it's 
very important to speak about intergenerational data. All of that today, of course, absolutely. Previous intervention and also, also the other speakers that are part of this panel, how it important it is to have this data. So uh, I, I'm in a, a, a situation because sort of between ages, huh? I, <laughs> I used to be young and involved uh, within within youth organizations. <laughs> Uh, and certainly I'm going to become older. So pro potentially I will be part of the elderly organization of, of my political party. So therefore, of course, uh, I can also say that I want to be represented. But in the same time, I believe, uh, like you both said, that there is a switch, there is a change on how people perceive politics and their engagement into politics as such. I think there are two kinds of people that engage in politics. We have those that get engaged because they are fighting for a specific topic or they, they engage in a political party that is defending their ideas, their beliefs, their values, or a topic that is of interest for them. And here we have different kinds of people. Young people tend to go for political parties, young, fighting for young people or topics of interest for them, like climate. Elderly people are going towards people, uh, parties that are fighting for them, speaking about pensions, social protection, and other elements regarding, uh, of course, of, of, of importance for, for elderly people. But we also have those that go into political parties because they want to pursue a career. We have that category of people. And those people are, of course, share the values of the political party, but are willing, to a certain extent, in comparison to the first group, to wait more. But they want to pursue a career, so they are constructing things, and they want things to be well organized. The difficulty of our political parties today is that we are trying to get both groups in the same time. But both groups are very different from each other. The ones pursuing a political career are willing to wait. No, they want things to be organized. They want to know the steps that are going to bring them at the top of the political landscape and so forth. The other group wants results immediately. We want the political party to do this. We want to influence the decision. We don't need to wait for the leaders to have a meeting and to decide every month what they are going to do. And it's quite complicated. And this puts traditional parties like social democratic parties in Europe in a difficult situation. So the solution for that is to do both things in the same time. You need a well-organized structure that is developing things in a traditional way, democratizing things, like you said, a little bit more inside the parties, but really having things that are well-defined and predictable to a certain degree in what things and how things are being organized. And of course, those that want to influence things, they need to pursue this element as well. In the same time, the party needs to develop ways to engage with those people that want immediate results. And in order to do that, you can create movements around the party. And I saw from different political parties that this has worked. This is the case also of the political party that I'm representing. I come from PSD Romania. We have a youth organization, a strong one, an elderly organization, a strong one. And we created, I think many, many years ago in 2007, when we integrated the European Union, a movement that is more progressive within the party because our party was considered to become or to be rather conservative. And we created this, uh, this movement and we have 10,000 members across the country. So we uh, have more members actually than the, two, the other organizations. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we know that our members are not there always to do, political, uh, do politics for, for a career. They go there because they want to engage on a specific topic. And I imagine, of course, on green issues, on specific social issues, on, uh, on, 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 on the Ukrainian war, for instance, on the issue of peace, on the issue of, of, of recovery. We have specific issues that are attractive for people, and we need to identify them and to construct those movements around the party. Those movements that are constructed around that party, that are supported by the par party, like you said very well, uh, of course, need to involve the civil society, need to involve the trade unions, need to involve people that have knowledge about that respective topic. And this is a way to go. Basically, uh, the conclusion of, of my initial intervention is that there is a need of renewal. There isn't a perfect model, but it's it is clear today that, of course, this renewal has to come from us. We have to lead this renewal of, of political parties, reorganize a little bit things within our parties, try to define who we want to get and how we want to get those people and what we want from those people that we are getting towards us. Some of them are going to remain within the party, construct a career, 
others are going to simply support us in a campaign or support us on a specific topic. But certainly we cannot be again, again, those big movements that keep people together for many years along. So people are going to change, they change opinions and we have to adapt, be flexible, but in the same time, be well organized. Thank you, thank you. I have um, some more questions for, for the panelists. Uh, just uh, a brief reply if, if you want. I just would like to ask you uh, what are, what's your opinion about um, uh, the role of civic education and training? What, what role can that play um, in, uh, to, to enhance the part, uh, democratic participation? And secondly, uh, how can young and old activists learn from each other? So can you have can you give some thoughts about those questions just briefly reply please yeah jos please yes um for instance we, we 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 see now that for instance in formal education history is become very very important mm -hmm. and for me is it important you don't can work to the future if new if you not knew the history. what's happened and as elder generation, we are experienced the good and the bad things. And I think that we need to make more, as we did in Brussels tonight together with Natalie, with Natalie to make common discussions on these issues and to mix the audiences and to listen to another and not to be pendant as elderly and we know it, no, to listen to another. That I find very important. And there is another thing that Victor was saying. It's about for us, members of parliament has to become people's representatives. And I find it very important also to have contacts with the organized uh, civic society. There is a lack, and I know PES is doing it, FEPS is doing it, but on national level, the party should me, as the Romanian told it, build contacts with these organizations. And other thing is that Political education is very important. In our party, we have ambassadors for the party, and that are professionals. Now, for me, every member of parliament should become an ambassador for the party, for our values. Mm -hmm. And there I said, we need also political education. And then I go back to my proper education in university. We were talking about Paulo Freire. Yeah going to the people to ask them how they conceive the problems, how they see their, uh, their proper uh, situation. And people learn to make, to evaluate the situation and to translate it in policy. And that is political education. And I think that our parties should reinvent these things. Mm -hmm. Also, I talk about more contacts between young and old, and also the importance of education. And in the first panel, I found it very important that it, it was raised in this. Okay, thank you, Jos. Um, Anna or Victor? Um, first, when we are talking about intergenerational solidarity and how can we uh, smoother it, um, gener the, the disagreement between generations has always existed and mm -hmm. I think will exist. It's very natural and normal process. And I think, and this is how also society develops when children always rebel against parents and this is that is as i mentioned totally normal um but our task uh, is also uh, to smoothen uh, this dialogue to uh, facilitate this dialogue and as, as an example i can uh, give you our projects like where we are today mm -hmm. because we have been working on it since three years now it's a third uh, cycle and um, we, as a Young European Socialist Senior Association, PS and FEPS, we have been part of this process, how to also um, come together, how to uh, overcome the obstacles. And I must say, it has not been always very easy or smooth. It has their uh, difficulties, um, but we always managed to take uh, what uh, each of us can bring the best in the discussion, in the table, what seniors can often uh, offer with their uh, wide experience, what young people can offer with their enthusiasm. So we managed to 
uh, have some kind of a mixture of um, of these experiences of uh, um, of backgrounds. And I think uh, it is it is uh, something that uh, should be done more. Uh, not only by us, as uh, Jos was mention mentioning, but, but on other levels as well. As well, previous panel was referring to civic education, strengthening the civic education. And I think it's also very important to have it not only in formal, but also informal and non-formal educations. Um, so uh, yes, I think that uh, we all here are really contributing to this a lot. Um, and yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to say at the moment. Thank, Thank you, you, Anna. Uh, Victor? Let us be clear. We speak about the need for political education. Mm -hmm. So learning how we can influence things in the society, in a democratic society. And actually, if we really pay attention to what people are saying to us, they believe that they cannot influence things. And most of the time they believe so because they do not know how, because things have become maybe too complicated, mm -hmm. maybe because they are too busy with their lives and we don't go towards them enough. So if we want to change things, if we want to fight also against non-democratic movement, we need to improve the knowledge about our democracies, about things, how things are working, about how political parties are working, about how democracy is working at local, national, and European level. And here, political parties do have a role. Political foundations do have an important role to play. And we need to do that in a very active way. And when I mean active way, and I'm going to be here maybe more direct, it's not about having a meeting in a nice building at the fifth floor. It's about going where people are. So that means going in the streets, going in the schools, going in the universities, going in the seniors clubs, in the youth clubs, going towards people and listen to them, but also share with them our experiences. Because I think that is something that we are not exploiting enough. Is the experience that our members, each of our members has within our parties. For instance, I'm seeing you, maybe the ones that are online cannot see the people that are in front of us right now, but we have 40 people here. I think each of you has something that might be interesting for me, but I don't know that. And as a, sometimes in our political parties, we invite people to attend meetings. We speak here in front, but we don't ask the people in the back to share with us their experience, their know-how, their expertise. Some of you might be good in economics. Some of you might be good in political science. Some of you might be good in education, but I don't know that. And we have thousands of members within our parties, within the youth organization, within the seniors organizations. And we, we invite them to meetings, but we don't ask them enough to share with us their experience. So I think if we want to become active in you know, improving civic education, we have to speak to those people and convince those people to engage with us in sharing their knowledge, their expertise, their experience with others uh, in different places across our country. So I think we have to deploy a program in this regard. Uh, I know we spoke about that for many, for, uh, many times within the PS, within the, within the FEP structure. I know there are bureaucratic constraints also imposed by the European authorities. And I think maybe we can, we can talk about that at some point. But I think it is something that we need to do. Transform our members in active promoters of democratic participation. If we are capable in doing that, this will redefine our parties, redefine how people perceive the old social democracy, redefine how people perceive the old democratic model and convince them that this democratic model functions if we take advantage of how it works. And maybe, because I'm really scared after the French elections, to be very frank, yeah. that I, know I see that across Europe. People want new things, new things, new things, but they don't have the time to evaluate how those new things actually, or what those new things actually mean. Because in some cases, what is new hides in the back authoritarian regimes, non-democratic values, and so forth. So this is why I believe we have to understand that we have to, to go towards people and really get engaged, and our members can be an active force for that. Thank you. 
So a lot of input. Um, I think it's high time that uh, we listen to uh, our audience and uh, do into practice what Victor says. So uh, please share your thoughts with us and, and um, uh, take the floor and what you think of what you have heard uh, until now. Uh, what do you think of it? Do you have own experiences to share? Uh, do you have questions? Uh, please share them with us. So in social democratic yeah. parties, we like to criticize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please do, start, please yeah. do, please do. Yeah. So, so if in, in the meantime, when you are thinking about a question, uh, uh, I can, I want, would like to reflect on, on what Victor said uh, at the end, the importance of um, democratic values and yeah, the value of democracy. Sometimes young people, they don't realize the, the value of democracy. Because um, uh, and when, when you look then uh, at, as you said, all the non-democratic movements are, are coming up all over Europe, they, they don't understand the consequences of that. Uh, so they, they don't enjoy what democracy, they don't enjoy elections. <laughs> uh, I have done a lot of work as an election observer uh, several years ago in African countries. I assisted to the first democratic uh, elections in South Africa. And when you, when you saw there the, the joy and the happiness of the people that they could finally vote. And then when you come back to Belgium and I said, oh, oh, we have to vote, you know, I, 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 I don't care, I, I, I am not going. And so how to, how to uh, yeah, make sure that young people understand the absolute value of democracy? It's, it's my question. Yeah, please. I think it's really uh, difficult for young people to, to mic, realize what uh, democracy values mean yeah. if you have not lived without them. And yeah, exactly. maybe that's the big difference between mm -hmm. generation is that elderly people have probably yeah. experienced what living without true democracy values means in real mm -hmm. life and what are the uh, in your direct and daily life, yeah. but um, it's it's still possible to explain this to young people because I also see that uh, young people, meaning younger than me, twenty and maybe less, mm -hmm. are really interested in social causes and um, climate change, and that's a very major concern. Uh, that really young people have and that we as young do not um, see that all people have the same worries that we have mm -hmm. about climate and maybe that would be um, a big um, fight that we should share between generations because obviously it touches like everyone but in my opinion, that's the biggest issue between generations that we young, and maybe that's normal because we are young, we want something very impactful and we do not see this um, need for urgent change like now. Mm -hmm. And maybe that should be the major question to fight for together between generation because obviously it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. To debate on what you just said. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jos, you want to reply? Yes, I, I am thinking also together with, with, with us. And I think it's also very important to, to experience that there is also a change in the conception of formal education. 
Mm -hmm. And I think, and in, it, it was also addressed in the first panel, and I found it very in, in, important from Solidar. As we were in formal education, we, we had hours and hours of history. We had also citizens' education. And now education is be educated to function in economics. Mm -hmm. And I think as we as progressive organizations um, have to ask us to ask in new politics is that in schools, it will be also young people will be, will be learned to listen to another and to participate in decision making. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And there is a look in this education. And we have to argue, we have to ask to reintroduce this kind of education in our formal educations. I find it very important. And I will also reflect, but because I, it, uh, I see Jacques and Rick in the audience, we, with the Louis Paul Bonkring, we, we can do it also as civil organizations. We had, an, and Ronnie was there for S, S Plus, we organized uh, during two years exchanges. Two scholars uh, with, with two schools in Brussels. The scholars were between 16 and 18 years old. And we organized contacts between us. And we talked about all things about sexuality, about war, about politics. And then you experience that in the youngsters, children coming from Africa, they have the experiences with war. Yeah. And it, for, for me, as elderly, I experienced war by my father who told me about the war. Uh -huh. But these children, and they were 16, 18 years old, have also experiences with war and out, um, dictatory. Uh -huh. And I think we can do a lot of things. But first thing in politics, I think that we need to change the, the continue of the formal education and to reintroduce civic education educating to democracy. And I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. That's what I will do, give to you. Okay. And one, one thing, a good experience also, because you talk about members of parliament and elderly. I give an example of uh, Antwerpen, where uh, the, the, the seniors of the party, and they call them the Red Lions, are contacting the young members of parliament and the young men of the city council. And they work together. The elderly are going to, to, to diffuse the, the information in the, in, the, in the briefcases. But on the other side, the members of parliament are going to the, to the seniors to discuss what they do. And it's important to have this, this types of, 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 of work. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Victor, you want to add something? And then we have to wrap it up. Sure, please. So uh, thank you for sharing with us your, your perspective. I think uh, there is a common topic. Well-being. Well-being in our societies for everyone. Of course, the well-being for elderly people and that might be different. But it comes together this, to this idea that everyone wants to live in a, in a, in a fair society. Uh, a, a, the you know the environment protected benefiting again from, from, from life and this is so well-being can be a common first with the pandemic and the war in ukraine people have understood that uh, this what we have right now can be put under threat and can be affected and we can lose everything also people now understand that we need to put our energies together the only the only way to get out of trouble and out of this crisis is to be united and, uh, and, and build on the, the solidarity between all of us. At the same time, they understand that we need a state, a structure mm -hmm. capable of providing protection and, 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 and delivering on this well-being of, of, for, for all of us. This offers the opportunity for social democratic movements to revive this important perspective that we want a strong state, the goal of protecting people, strong social state, and so forth. But the difficulty right now is that we have other political movements from the extreme right and from the extreme le left mm -hmm. that claim what we have defended 
for many years already. So we have to re, uh, recover, uh, win back again this idea mm -hmm. that we are the political movement that can ensure the well-being of people, that can protect people, that know what it has to do in order to lead the country, lead the European Union towards a democratic life, but also a life for everybody. I think this is an important element for all of us uh, in the future if we want to unite also generate. Okay, on these nice words, we are going to wrap up our uh, second panel. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Thank you also uh, in the room for uh, your thoughts uh, and ideas. Uh, we have come to the conclusion speeches, um, and I would like to give the floor to two organizations, <coughs> the representatives of uh, the two ends uh, of the scale, the younger and the elder ones. So uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Alicia Homs Ginell. She is uh, president of YES, uh, also a member of, of the European Parliament and a member of the Employment Committee. Okay, please. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jos, uh, for always uh, being together with YES for organizing this intergenerational uh, event that we have been doing online during these years of, of pandemic, but now finally we can do it in person and I'm really happy uh, that we have this chance to do it. Also, thank you to Febs, uh, Maria, to, to open your house uh, to do this event here and obviously to the PS uh, because they are always uh, helping us in everything. So I really want to, to be thankful with, with them. Uh, I think that uh, it has been told during the panels uh, that more and more uh, we are we becoming aware of the urgent need to develop a renovated, uh, inclusive and intergenerational uh, social contract in order to reach a more accessible society throughout all areas. Uh, in the last years, uh, we have uh, witnessed uh, the fragility of our welfare states and social protection systems, as well as our democracies. We have seen it in, in, in some countries in Europe, uh, sadly. Um, so we have uh, seen a spike in polarization, as well as spike in political skepticism uh, and disengagement. And we have seen, uh, and we have been able to understand that inequality is indeed a, a threat to our democracy uh, and to our social uh, cohesion. So the COVID crisis uh, has not made things easier to, to all of us and to all this situation, uh, but rather in haste uh, this chasm. And as we uh, know, it has hit uh, two specific generations in particular, that has been the younger ones and the older ones. Uh, so, but um, it is through crises uh, such as the ones we have been recently experiencing that we have uh, realized uh, the need for an intergenerational approach in order to reach the intergenerational uh, balance. So this can only be accomplished uh, through public policies uh, focused uh, on meeting the needs of all groups throughout their life cycle. Um, through educating our uh, society on democratic values that has been said uh, during the, uh, the panels and also engaging uh, it into democratic participation as well as creating institutions with transversal uh, competences, issues uh, such as aging process of our continent, the digital and gender gap and along etc. Of, of, of examples that can indeed be, ta be tackled. So uh, seeing aging as an opportunity for talent and experience and also youth as an opportunity for enthusiasm and fresh new perspectives and also ideas uh, and understanding both generations as complementary to each other. I think it's crucial to draw upon the existing assets uh, we own and uh, channel them towards more uh, representative and inclusive institutions. Uh, tackling challenges such as employment and sustainable uh, development uh, from an intergenerational perspective and incorporating uh, the active participation of intergenerational groups uh, rather than confronting uh, two generations uh, can only foster social cohesion as well as create uh, the sense of belonging uh, uh, and identification towards our democratic institutions that we currently uh, lack. 
Uh, also, it is uh, only through them, through active participation processes uh, and through engaging our youth as well as our elder into the decision making processes uh, that we will achieve this intergenerational balance uh, that will enhance and empower more the vulnerable, the more vulnerable and less uh, represented uh, generations. So. Uh, and I think also that we need to, to do so because we cannot take uh, democracy for granted. We have seen it uh, during these uh, years. Uh, we have seen it recently also. Uh, and we all have to take care of our institutions and work for a respectful, but also a plural uh, public debate. Uh, so I would like to end uh, by stating that we must remember uh, all generations have the responsibility to preserve the democratic systems uh, as has been built in the past by our elder uh, colleagues, uh, but also to improve them uh, in order to prepare them uh, for the future. But to prepare them for the future, uh, we need to do it now in the present. Uh, so I think that we need to work together uh, to, to improve these uh, democratic institutions, uh, to improve democracy, to protect democracy. Uh, and and, uh, and ha as has been already said uh, by one of the, the speakers in, here in the, in the public, uh, we as a generation, uh, we were born in, in democracy. Uh, we don't know how it is to lose it or how it is uh, to not live in a democratic system. Uh, but we have our elder that knows really well how is this situation and we need to listen to them to learn from them and to take care uh, together of, of this democracy so yeah thank you thank you alicia and i will not repeat what you said uh, thank to feps and thank to pes to make this possible but i think working on intergenerational solidarity it means two things. You have to organize both groups. And therefore, I appeal to our parties to also give the resources to the youngsters and to the elderly to organize themselves and to make sure that what we said today, that we can also afford it. I think it's very important. Second thing, I think that we need to share specific interest. In the first panel already, they talk about, I will become grandparent next week, I think. <laughs> and I know, and I know that if there is a lack of childcare, I will be the person <laughs> to take care. And I know when I become older and there is no elderly care, it will be my son who take care of me. Also, there are not generation-specific problems, we have to share our problems together. That's very important. And second, for me, it's very important, access to human rights. Digitalization is a very, very big problem and is a motor for more dualization society. And the elderly are the most impact on it. And we have bad experiences on this issue in in uh, COVID. I think that we need to look to this digitalization and more to access to rights. There is already in every member state a commissar for children's rights. We need also to have them for all generations. Very important access because how a society become more and more difficult for people and people who the most need access to the rights are the most, are, are the least um, experienced to achieve this. Also, I think that we have to look at the access to rights. And secondly, we have also to implement, I think that it, that's to be a very important issue in the next election uh, campaigns. That is that our society and the communities become all age friendly. If you are age friendly, it means that parents with children, children, but also elderly can be happy. And I come back to the well-being ID from Victor. I think it's very important that we talk to organize our societies as 
blindly for all ages. And at least I will thank you. And I will also make a kind of proposal. We did it yet three times. It's Facebook. I don't see the steeple in Facebook. Are they are there? <laughs> and we are here. But why not next year to more, more, to make more of these meetings? Alicia, you are in Spain, and we have a very strong Spanish organization. Next year in Madrid. <laughs> and I see here, and I see here young socialists, French speaking and Dutch speaking. Elderly, French speaking and Dutch speaking. Next year, we will organize in Brussels. 29th of April, we see another. In Brussels also is important because we need to bring together the two communities, the Flemish and the French one. Also for next year, and I ask also the audience, look in your country if we can make more of this kind of activities. And thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. So we are finally at the end of our event. Uh, thanks our online followers uh, to have participated in this event. Thank you very much. Uh, you can keep you posted on our uh, social media channels or uh, subscribe uh, to our newsletters. And uh, before we invite you all to the drink next door here in the room, I'm sorry for the online followers, we will drink. <laughs> uh, but before we uh, go to there, we have to uh, announce the winner of the quiz. Uh, I don't know if you all participated uh, by using the QR code uh, for the little quiz. Uh, we have to indicate the winner. So I have to know who get who, or who got 10 points. Who got 10 points? Nobody? So nobody very at the top. Who got nine points? Nobody. Oh my God. Uh, eight. Seven. Someone had some points. <laughs> uh, six. Six. Ah, oh, we have a winner. <laughs> okay. Six points. So you, you are going to get the prize later. <laughs> and, and the kisses of the moderator. Oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Official? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is really the end, folks. See you next. Yeah, bye. Yeah.